of how important it is to to not only think about data and you know scientific comparisons of land use models and and, and all these things but you know if we really want to change you know the 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 structure of subsidy payout you know going back to the to your question if we want to change the political framework the european agriculture policy if we want to change many of these systems it can only if you ask me come through you know the society all of us to understand the value of agriculture to understand that agriculture is more than just production of food it is always uh, it is always rural development, biodiversity, health, equality, you know, all these factors um, are, are, are agriculture. Um, and if society doesn't understand that what, what, what land use means, what food means in terms of the, the health benefits, but also in, in terms of what the, the way of, of how food is produced means for the regional context, for the people and the animals, and then, then it's getting difficult. And I think this is why we started doing so much more than well starting to to go much more into you know trying to touch people that are not yet in the agriculture bubbles and like like we are because most of them actually fall in love with it again you know we've just lost that connection but we still have time to build those bridges again and and, and have people reconnect to nature and and, and understand it um this was the reason why I wrote the book, or we wrote the book as a team. Uh, this was the reason why we agreed to to be part of the Disney Plus uh, documentary because we thought, okay, we need to touch people's emotions, we need to touch people's hearts. That that is the way forward in order to change the large system surrounding agriculture. Um, because it, in the end, at the end of the day, this is what we need to do. Um, we, um, yeah, agriculture and farming and farmers have to be at the at the epicenter of, of um, I don't know, <laughs> for lack of a better word, coolness. You know, the, the farmers are, are the custodians of our world and future generations, and that needs to be understood. And and, and the systems have to be changed accordingly. Benedict Basel is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media, Innovators Magazine, and the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. Beyond farming, building resilient ecosystems, Benedict's multifunctionality and traditional technology and biodiversity services is needed in a rural world. He is a regenerative farmer. Uh, that came initially uh, from the investment banking area. And because of his family in East Brandenburg, Germany, uh, Benedict's story is not the typical one. He himself could not have imagined that uh, well over 10 years ago, um, with uh, family uh, failures, soil, cows, and lots of hope that he would be in regenerative farming today. He's had a long path and he's got a much brighter future uh, coming ahead of his. He has a Disney Plus um, series called Farm Rebellion and uh, his book here is in German. Um, wonderful uh, read for those of you who read German. Is there a chance that it'll ever come out in English, Benedict? If I find an English publisher, uh, then yes, I hope so. I'm working on it. Okay, great. I want to welcome you to the podcast and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for the invitation. So I could definitely talk and give you an introduction much longer than that, but I want to hear. I want to hear it from you. You know, um, I I know your story, but many don't, and. I personally want to thank you. You've given Germans all over the world, not only in the Dach region, Germany, Austria, and, and Switzerland, 
Liechtenstein and all those other little areas that uh, speak German. Unbelievable hope, unbelievable vision of what's possible uh, in, in the future for families, for agriculture, for better models. Thank you so much. What brought you to this point? I'm schwitz. <laughs> when, when you say that, uh, but I'll You're sweating. <laughs> I'll, I'll pass it on to the family and the team. Um, well, it's a good question. So I think you know, in the end of the day, um, it's it's a multitude of things. First of all, I was very fortunate uh, because my parents um, had been the most incredible role models, um, not only as far as their professional work has been concerned, but also on, you know, a more sort of soft note as far as um, having been shown as from a very, very early age that hard work and discipline and a vision uh, in that combination pay off. Um, my, my, my mother specifically, <laughs> she's, she's just an unstoppable force of nature. Um, and she does everything with her will. And my father has other traits, which are very useful, which is, you know, he's, he's wise. He's, um, he's not to drastically, you know, jump on things, but you know, he takes his time and he's cool and, um, he observes very well. So, um, my parents basically are, are the key if, if you, if, if I can say it. Um, and then also more on the professional note, you know, um, the farm that, that we are operating on right now is, is an hour east of Berlin. Uh, this is obviously an area that has gone through its own incredible history and obviously also not always easy history. Um, and it belongs, it goes back to the family of my step grandfather. So my step grandfather's family had lived here for 250 years and after the war in 1945, my step grandfather flew uh, to Western Germany. Um, and then after the wall went down, he came back and obviously everything was destroyed and nothing reminded him of, of what it looked like when, when he left. Um, and because he fled 1945, he didn't have any restitutional claims. So he didn't get the land back as many others did in the area. Um, but he had to buy it back. And my father, luckily at that time, was uh, also a banker and um, earning enough to facilitate my family basically starting this idea, this vision of building the farm and the estate back to what it used to be. Um, and that process took 25 years. It's, in, in a sense, it's still going on. Um, through the land reform, you must imagine that a, an agricultural field of, let's say, I don't know, 75 acres would have around 50 or 60 or even 70 different owners. And you would have to go and find them. And some were deceased, others didn't even know that. So it's a, it's a, such a long process and, and also a daring process to, to try to get that vision coming together. And then um, after around, I would say, yeah, 15, 20 years, my parents realized, okay, this idea of actually building the farm back together you know, starting in the early nineties, um, might actually work out. And this is where my sisters come in because my sisters then together with my parents and me started in this, um, discussion of, um, thinking of how shall, shall it be passed on in the family. Um, and my parents were very strongly of the opinion that it can only go into one's hand. Um, because as soon as you split it up, one of them, one of the sisters, siblings wants to go out, then. You know, if the others can't afford it, that's the end of it. Um, so it was a lengthy discussion and, uh, and, and luckily my sisters at some point said, okay, um, Benny should do it. So, um, that, that was, um, uh, enabling me to, to actually be able to do it. Although to be totally honest with you at that time, I was like 19 and, um, I mean, you know, I grew up here in a sense, um, I was always hunting, I was always trapping any kind of animal that you can think of raising any kind of thing, animal that you can think of. Um, but agriculture and ecological agriculture in Eastern Brandenburg, that sounded very much not very sexy to me at all. <laughs> right. When I was 19, I was thinking about, you know, I want to be in the city and New York and London and what else. Uh, 
And um, <clears throat> so I thought, you know, there's something up for grabs. I might as well take it and then see what you do with it later, <laughs> later on. <laughs> Lucky, luckily for me, um, my, my parents probably were still are a lot smarter than I. So they said, you know, I should do it. And um, it took me the, uh, let's say a good 10 years to actually realize what agriculture, what land use means, not only in classical, you know, production of food terms, but even more so as, as the number one solution of overcoming some of the biggest problems of our time. And um, um, luckily, let's say my, um, my drive um, hasn't left me, although I'm not in the financial industry anymore. <laughs> I'm just using it for, for hopefully better things. Who knows? That's so beautiful to hear. And it's wonderful because it really all starts with family. Uh, it's not only the, the, the uh, family you're in. We last saw each other and, and, and Malta at the Green Vision Summit and you we're so lucky to have your family with you. You, uh, you do that quite often, I hear and, and have seen uh, your, your girlfriend, Tess Ward, and also your beautiful children. Quincy is at school now, I guess, or Kita. Yep. Um, she's wonderful. And then you have a baby boy, and I forget his name, but uh, Rudy. Just, uh, Rudy. Rudy, I just wanted to gobble them up when I saw them in Malta, and Tess was the lioness mother, very protective, but uh, um, they are such beautiful children. And so you're very fortunate and lucky. And then also to be with a partner who's really involved in food. And, and I think you guys, not only uh, partners in life and children, but you're also kind of complimenting each other on the farm and doing as much as possible. Um, uh, how how did that come about? And and uh, you know, this is a wonderful uh, uh, chef and cookbook author and and successful in her own right. How did that all come about? Well, I mean, um, interesting that you ask, <laughs> but we we do have an interesting uh, love story, I would say. Um, that is that uh, Tess used to live in London. She's she's from the UK and. Um, as you said, she was an author, um, wrote a cookbook and was very much engaged in different events around cooking and, and just, you know, very much active in, in different projects in that department, doing a master's in, in neuroscience. Um, and she also did a podcast and she wanted to talk to a farmer because through her master's in neuroscience, she understood sort of the connection of food with the brain and, and sort of mental illness, mental well-being. Um, and someone, I think, to told her about the role of soil health in that regard and that of course you know that dazzles your mind once you hear that for the first time many of us many many people do not know this when they hear it for the first time they you know it, it doesn't leave you so she reached out to a few people and said well don't there's like this german farmer who's a regenerative farmer why don't you talk to him and then i spoke to her on on a video call like this uh, luckily we never publicized it but i was just the most unprofessional <laughs> guest you could think of because I was I think in love with her for the first within the first second and and I was just making silly jokes and being really not very funny I think um but maybe a bit sweet I don't know but uh, so so then um I just continue I just kept um calling her afterwards and, and doing sort of video calls with her and this was the beginning of 2020 so while corona hit off and everything got locked down of which actually we here on the farm never had that much connection with. Uh, we were in the middle of planting season. We had 30 volunteers planting agroforestry systems out there. And I was always with one foot in jail, but anyway, so, um, she, we said, look, let's, let's meet, let's, let's see how we can do this. So I brought her, um, a working contract and I found, um, a piece of paper mentioning her name and an address here in Germany. <laughs> And I sent this over to her, which meant she could come. Um, so I picked her up in uh, in Berlin and drove her here. And then, um, and then life, you know, um, decided uh, our future in a sense. No, but um, we were lucky enough to be pregnant after four months. And um, now we have, as you said, we have two kids. And I know her longer pregnant or breastfeeding than I do um, her. <laughs> 
sort of without one or the two. Um, and, you know, sometimes life is unexplainable and, and funny. And, um, you know, if, if, if anything, if it has taught me that, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm turning 40 this year. Um, and I always wanted to have kids. I always wanted to be a dad. This was always for me very sure. I always wanted to be a young dad. I still call myself a young dad now, but obviously I'm not, but, um, you know, you can't plan everything. And, and, um, I guess you just have to trust and, and hope for the best. And then sometimes life has this funny way of, um, you know, um, yeah, maybe fulfilling, um, or maybe not. And looking back at all makes sense, but looking at it, it, it rarely does. Um, so yeah, that's how I know it. Uh, that's how we know each other. And, you know, she's, she's brilliant and she, she brings in just so much depth and, and beauty and, and, um, also on a on sort of a professional way, like I'm, I'm understanding more and more that, you know, um, when you think about system change, when you think about transformation, you know, we, I think we all tend to think in data and processes and systems and, you know, and, and I think it is so much more about taste and a feeling and some spirituality forms of, of, of connecting people and, and things, you know, it's, yeah. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I couldn't, I hope she says. And, and it's, re it's really about uh, a family too. It's about more depth. It's not a job, it's life. You're actually do living life. And now how, how wonderful is it that what, what you're doing is, is really plays in all aspects of your family. And it's really, really beautiful interplay of, of that. And you're, you're, you're very lucky, but I, I think that it, everyone has the ability to structure their lives in certain ways and have those, those wonderful moments as well. I, I appreciate you sharing that with us. So although this is in German, uh, it's basically translated rebels of the earth, you know, uh, it was published March, 2023 which is pivotal, pivotal, and uh, as you can kind of see here, uh, those who are, who are watching, the viewers, it received uh, the award as Spiegel's bestseller. Uh, it has really um, gone far, you know, not only the book, which uh, kudos, because you basically um, took your team that you had, uh, uh, I don't. I want you to describe your team, ragtag team, or or however that was put together of just beautiful, wonderful people, and went in to a thousand hectares of the sandiest, driest German soils that that there are, and over these uh, years um, have really rebuilt uh, a system of biodiversity, regenerative agriculture. And you describe that in the book, and you uh, don't hold back, which I really love. You, you've given as many people and everybody that I can think of kudos um, in the book and listed their books and their sources and where to go to find out about the places where you've gotten this knowledge. Um, because as you said, you're here an investment banker and... Uh, I, 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 that this information didn't come, even though you grew up in a family that had farmland and were farmers in some respect, um, and your grandpa was also in, in banking, uh, you had to get the wisdom somehow to do this and also to do it very ecological. So I, I want to kind of go into not just the book, but what was this journey look like? It, it, it must have been amazing because the the world was your oyster. You didn't say, oh, I'm just going to follow Rudolf Steiner's biodynamic uh, 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 standard of organics. You pretty much could pick and choose how you put together the different types of practices that now you're implementing on the farm. How did that process look? And and maybe even shout out how that went for you, if it, if it, was, if it was hard and you struggled or it was really a fun journey. Um, well, I'm still not quite sure, <laughs> but, uh, no, I mean, you know, so first of all, 
I was a lousy banker um, and, and never an investment banker. I was doing mergers and acquisitions. So more a okay. consultant in a, in a bank than anything else. Um, after doing three years of banking, I went into uh, restructuring uh, for real estate company uh, for another two, three years. And then towards the end, I was working for a venture capital mm -hmm. investor looking specifically at agriculture technology startups. Um, just to wrap that up, in those 10 years of my financial work, this was kind of the, 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 the different steps that I went through, um, each having obviously an influence of, on how I feel and how I think and how I see the world and, and, and what kind of goals and targets I set for myself. Uh, certainly having an influence on my value systems, you know, specifically going back to the financial crisis, you know, being in a bank to see how like a bank, like this fixed structure just collapses with, within it, itself. And, you know, who is, who is to blame and, and who's carrying the burden, you know, those kind of things was just very much, um, yeah, had a, had a big influence on how I see, uh, how I see the world. Um, but, um, so, and, and that kind of is important to understand because coming from this world of startups in the agriculture world, and this was, you know, more than well, around 10 years ago, ag tech as such wasn't yet that that's far developed and, and, and not many were thinking about it. There was one or two funds in the US and there was Antera in, in, in the Netherlands. These were the only three ag tech funds that were actually being raising money. And there was a few startups uh, that started around the, those days. Um, and I came from that world. So I started, you know, going around and trying to convince companies in Germany and also politics and on the associations to say, we need a, a fund for agriculture technology in Germany. You know, this is going to be the next big thing. We've got a ton of challenges. And, you know, if Germany wants to be part of a competitive idea on, on, this, on, on technology innovation in, in the agricultural space, the time is now, you know, we, we don't have the land, we don't have, you know, we need to be innovation leaders if, if, if we want to be taking part in that. Um, and at, at the same time, I, I realized how, well, first of all, how many startups in the space were having difficulties because, you know, there's no such thing as an MVP in, in agriculture. If you want to convince a farmer that already is under pressure, has no time, no money, no nothing, other than I need a, a reliable solution to a problem that is profitable and works immediately, um, then it takes a long time to develop that product. Um, and at the same time, you know, I realized how, how little is happening in that space because everyone is so strongly fixated on their own narrative. Um, if it be the associate, associations, the, the politicians, the companies, the firms, the farmers, um, so th this was kind of the time where I realized, okay, if you really want to change something, if you really want to do something, then, you know, there's no other way of doing it yourself. Um, underlying was also that in every kind of pitch document of startups back in the day, it was always the kind of same assumptions about the future, you know, until 2050, we have to do increase production by 70% and we've got problems with degraded soils and climate volatility and whatever, whatever. And it's like, these these problems are already the challenges that we have on the farm at home so i also realized okay this is like what are we talking about this is already a reality this is not a future uh, so these were different aspects for me to decide to actually go home and so when i came here my first idea was okay i'm gonna raise a fund a venture capital fund and i'm gonna give land to farms uh, to i'm gonna give land to startups to actually use their technologies and develop their technologies to get an MVP or to get something MVP ready. And by giving them some land and some place to live and maybe a laboratory or an office, I get some shares in their company. And at the same time, I use the fund also for financing other startups, which are a bit later stage, so to say. And then I bring in all the technology and all the science and the politicians, and I do this, you know, modern technology, startup, science, whatever. Um, and, um, and while I was doing that, I had to bring sort of the technological level of my farm equipment. So all my tractors and my combine harvester and the farm management and whatever you have 
on like the most advanced technological state. And that would have just that on its own would have been an investment of one and a half million euros, which I have no money, like I have no capital background that I could have financed that with. I would have taken out a loan, obviously, from a bank. And through that, I thought, wait a second. So I would have to get so much debt in order just to be on a technological level that the machines kind of can talk to each other and there is some data and whatever, but it has nothing to do with what, what, what is surrounding me. It has nothing to do with the basis of, of, of my future profitability because I'm not investing into the soil. I'm not investing into anything other than something that it's intangible. I can't even touch it. I can't repair it. It's, it's just there, but it's not there, you know? So I thought that this is kind of weird because I also realized for the next 10 years, I will have to stay in the same production method just to pay back the bank. And at the same time, this was uh, 2017, 2018, 2017, uh, we had the first big drought. So we had actually from that point on, we had five droughts in, in, a, in, a, in a row. Um, and I came outside. We didn't have rain for 12 weeks. This was in the beginning of the year. So the most vegetable, well, the most vegetable, the most vegetative state where we need obviously most of the rain. Um, and everything was just dry and, and dead and yellow and brown. And although it was early April, mid, mid April. And I thought, what am I doing here? What am I thinking about? What, like I had, I had no connection to the needs of the land and I didn't see it. I didn't realize any of it because I was always like technology and startups and whatever. So in that moment I was like, okay, this is all completely the opposite, the very opposite of what I need to do. So then I stopped all of that and all the contract negotiations with large corporates that I already had going on and said, no, this cannot be it. There needs to be alternative solutions. There needs to be alternative methods. If I do anything here, be it invest capital, time, love, blood, tears, whatever, it needs to feed into the basis of the operation, which is the soil, which is the ecosystem, which is biodiversity. So then I had this phase where I said, well, what am I going to do now? Because my mother actually was the one already um, adapting our agriculture operation to ecological agriculture in 2004. So we were already kind of doing good agriculture and well, good ecological agriculture. But to be honest with you, if you do ecological industrial agriculture, it, it, it has the potential to be just as bad as any other conventional agriculture form. Because if we have a harvest and then we plow, we, we plow three times until the autumn, uh, to kill the wheat pressure, and then we grow a monoculture and do the same. We we can destroy soil so so beautifully, you know. It's it's just yeah. Anyway, the definition of the production system is not uh, what the outcome always looks like, right? It is. It, it's not the definition of the word. It's it's the outcome at the end of the day. Anyway, different different discussion. So. Um, yeah, anyway, then I was like, okay, what am I going to do? Because um, what we were doing, ecological industrial agriculture was killing the soil and, and biodiversity. So that wasn't an option. And I didn't want to go back to conventional for, for other reasons. Um, and I knew that technology on its own is also not going to help us uh, because I a, can't afford it. And B, I don't want to be even more dependent than I, than I already was. So then I started really looking all over the world. And this was, you know, beginning of, well, towards the end of 17. So um, I mean, there wasn't regenerative agriculture, especially in Germany, was not a thing at all. There was no one talking about it. If you Googled it, you wouldn't find anything. Um, even on a sort of global perspective, I mean, it's always what you know is what you know. I didn't know much, so I had to, I was just Googling as much as you can possibly think of. And I wrote thousands and thousands of emails to farmers, startups, um, innovators, companies, uh, scientists, everywhere. And I was just always saying, look, guys, I have a thousand hectares of sand here. Uh, if you're working on these problems, please come. Uh, you can work here with me. You can, I don't want any money. I, you can live here for free, but let's work on these topics together. You know, let's solve some of these problems together. Um, and no one really ever wrote back until some, <laughs> at some point, someone did. And then they said, have you heard something? Have you heard about agroforestry? No, agroforestry, no. 
So then I had the first sort of term looking into it and I saw, ah, okay, breaking up an agricultural field with some tree lines and that has an influence on the wind speed, microclimate, water uptake, water storage, that makes sense. Okay. And then from there, it's slowly but surely, you know, I, I went on to find more more examples. And, you know, uh, I guess these are many people that 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 we, we know of today much better than, than back in the day. But Ernst Gutsch, for instance, from Brazil, Gabe Brown from the US, Alan Savory from South Africa, and, and the list goes on. And, um, and, you know, for me, that was really, I think that was for me, like the biggest moment as in like, wow, you know, like, like this was insane because I, and not only I found them, but all of them have, have just been reliably, insanely, well, successful with what they were doing. And they were not only successful from like an ecological, you know, let's build an ecosystem again. No, it was also a profitable business model. And at the same time, it was ecologically and socially uh, admirable. And that was the reason why it was profitable in the first place. So that was like, wow, why is not the whole world talking about these people and these methods and this philosophy of land use where because you do it according to a regional ecological context, you are more profitable. And the definition of more profitable is, is always creating value also in biodiversity terms, water uptake, water storage terms, soil health terms, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, this is just insane. Like how, how can we have slipped, how can we let our system slip so far and, and not be doing this? You know, like there's no, there's no, there's no economic system on the planet that is as badly designed as our agricultural system. <laughs> you know, it's absurd. Anyway, so <clears throat> once I found these, I, for me, you know, everything was set. I knew, okay, this is, this is my task in life. This is, this is what I want to do. So I thought, okay, I'll bring all these different methods of regenerative agriculture, the different composting firm, uh, composting methodologies, agroforestry, syntropic agroforestry, tree nursery, holistic grazing, uh, agriculture, re well, regenerative ecological crop rotation, all of them on our soil and our on our estate here, because first we are in our east of Berlin, so it's something that you, you know, it's it's a place where you can come to. Um, and at the same time, it is just incredibly sandy soil and very, very low precipitation. So we already are suffering from the problems that are exponentially growing across the planet, unfortunately, which is sandy, well, degraded soil, sandy soil, uh, and, 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 and uh, unreliable weather fluctuations. And I thought if we can prove that those methods are economically, ecologically, and socially profitable, um, and on our very tough and difficult setting, um, then that can be part of, of, of changing the narrative and changing, um, the paradigm. Um, so that was, that was the idea. And, and, and with that was always for me sure to find partners from the scientific community, um, to make sure that everything we go through the highs, the lows, the data, the processes is, is being able to be monitored and in a, in a sense used to pass that knowledge on because. I was looking for those, the, that knowledge. I was looking for numbers. I was looking for all these things and, and there was simply wasn't any, not that I would found it anywhere. So I, I knew that that's kind of what I want to do, use, um, what I had been given through my family, my background, um, and, and our, the, the toughness of, our, of our situation, which is still very tough, um, to, yeah, to do, to do something that hopefully makes sense and, and, and gives a lot of value to to people elsewhere there's when you're talking about uh, measurement data um, the numbers basically uh, there's really no comparables because we've had conventional agriculture and some organic and it really hasn't been measured it hasn't been measured of the true cost the total environmental cost of a uh, percentage of EBITDA and it also hasn't uh, been measured as far as the environmental impact. And, and it's really interesting because uh, you, you, you talk about the droughts uh, that occurred and the dry seasons that, that you had, but also at that same time in those droughts and dry seasons, we've also seen major destruction in Germany at the same time because of flooding. 
and that that's where the sand comes in because it's just sand and there's no fertile soils that there no moss and peat in the ground there's no wood wide web and an actual hold of the ground that soil just washes away and total uh, you know farmlands and and homes that have been built on sand just wash away and become now uh, weird weird floodplains i guess for the future which is really interesting you have done such a good job of this that uh, the global network of eco hydrology demonstration sites unesco an intergovernmental hydrological program through the the un unesco um honored you uh with you know kind of this uh igb the institute for freshwater and, and ecology in partnership with your foundation to really um go back and look at that. What What is that exactly? Is it an award or is it like they're coming in to study how how much you're restoring? What What is that all about? Um, I mean, this is all really um, not about us that much. This is all from the, from the IGB, which is like an institute here that specializes on different uh, water catchments, um, trying to assess, well, the different observable land use changes, weather changes, and do forecasting models and, and papers on what that means for us, what kind of adaption possibilities we have. And it all goes back to Prefer, Professor uh, Tetzlaff, um, who is just, um, yeah, she's, um, I was lucky to, to well, you know, sometimes life has this funny way of, of bringing you together. And, and, and this was the same here. Uh, I love, I love the concept of uh, serendipity um because she just asked if, if she can do some testing uh, in a, in an area of our farm and i said yes but only if we meet beforehand and then we met and we kind of get on really well so we were able to to use that and and just grow it on a much bigger scale and and this is where kind of the um the yeah uh, this whole concept of 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 um the, the unesco you know utilization of that um, description is concerned, but it's it's not an it's not an award as such. I think it's a recognition of the work that the IGB and, and Professor Tesla have done, and, and also to to start collecting some of that data as well. So I think that that's really great. But you ha you did in two thousand and twenty two. You received the uh, Farmers Award from Naturland, uh, um, and I, I believe that the Bundes uh, Minister. Um, the federal economic minister, uh, Sam Ozdemir, um, awarded you that. Um, in, in that award, not only is it a great honor, Naturland is the kind of one of the standards for the old biodynamic organic standards, kind of a standard there, and, and is, is well recognized, as well as Demeter and Biolant and so so. That's a really great award. I want to want to ask two things in conjunction to that. What you've said prior, as you're going in, you're trying to implement all these things. What pushback or what difficulties or hurdles have you run into, and have you seen in farming regulation to try to do agroforestry, to try to do uh, uh, regenerative practices that you that you're getting from all these. Um, sources around the world in germany on your farm uh is there any pushback or do you have a uh, pretty free reign of of what you can implement to restore and regenerate or do you find some difficulties there um well that's also that's a very good question i mean i could tell you so much about this uh, but um to um to not run it for too long um Basically, so everything that we are doing, uh, yeah, I mean, Joel Sullivan actually, uh, I think, termed this phrase very nicely, saying, "Everything I want to do, I'm, or, everything I do is forbidden," or something like that, which, which is pretty much what we encounter too. Um, all the methods that we are trying to imply, well, they they are not, they are not foreseen for the standard regulation of, of the authorities and and how sort of the whole payout of the subsidies is organized right um 
all of that has a very different setting and idea and, and, and mind frame. So we had to, we're, well, we have two things that we are trying to use. The first is uh, on the more sort of, uh, on the very, very progressive forms of, of land use changes that we have implied, uh, specifically thinking about syntropic agroforestry. Um, we have actually made sure that we are not um, applying for any subsidies because that way, you know, no one can say, well, you know, you, you put in the wrong source code or whatever. Um, we are basically, fr we are free to do what we want to do there. It means we, we don't get the money for that, but for that particular spot, but then that's the, the, the risk that we are carrying all the other things. And I mean, we are, we are applying those principles on all of the land that we have. Um, we are just very fortunate that to have very, very good connections to our authorities here, you know, um, I think that has always been very important to me to, that they know who we are and that there is a, a relationship and trust. And, and, and I think that is the basis for being able to do things that you're not necessarily supposed to do. And because people from in the authorities here in, in the regional context, at least this is my observation and my experience is that they are from the area. They know the challenges that we are facing. They know of, of the hardship that, that um, comes with having to run a farm or having or, or being lucky to run a farm on, on the land that is like ours with weather conditions that are like ours. So they've always been very, very sort of helpful. But um, yeah, the standard model of producing as much as you can for the cheapest possible price um is is not what we're trying to um, accomplish and um, the rules and regulations for that are you know giving you a very very tight space to be active in um and to be honest with you you know this is like maybe going like one or two steps back because i always find this very interesting and i always mention this also in my in in, in, in my um keynotes or, 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 you know, when talking to people is that, you know, we, we have developed an agriculture system that is very, very good as, at producing masses at the cheapest possible price. But that came at with, with three large influences, which are all, yeah, all complicated to solve. The first one is sort of on um, the production, pr production side itself. We are just, and you know this, of course, but we are producing insane externalized cost of production, right? If it, the soil health loss, uh, biodiversity loss, uh, water depletion, whatever it is, you know, um, there's different studies now being published. Um, it's something between five times the, the, the value of production. <laughs> We're producing five times the cost of, of the value of production or um, going back to the last study of the Food um, Systems Economics Commission, they said, the externalized cost of agriculture production is, I think, 12% of global GDP. It's just mind blowing, right? So that is one thing. The other thing on, on, on the farm level is that farmers have always done what they're supposed to do, right? That no, really no farmers, not really no farmers to blame. They have specialized, invested, they've grown, and now they are caught in that system of dependency and they can't do anything to get out because they're dependent on world market prices, input prices subsidies, the loans and whatnot. So, so they can't really change that much. And the third part is, and that kind of comes back to, to the question, you know, all the systems surrounding agriculture have also been focused on mass production, cheapest possible price. So access to land for young people, education about, you know, the complex interaction of soil with, with roots and the plant. Uh, instead of focusing on purely chemistry-related uh, instruments, um, how the capital market be part of this. Um, of course, looking at true values and true costs in that regard. Um, the whole idea of, of science and the, and the scientific focus. Yeah, Do we want to produce something that has huge externalized costs or do we want to have externalized benefits and costs as part of a land use philosophy and then use that you know, as, as, as the way forward. Um, similarly with, with, um, the technology innovation and, and, and the definition of innovation yeah? is something innovative, but if it causes suffering, 
it shouldn't be innovative. That's really not innovative at all. <laughs> it's, you know. Anyway, so and 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 I think that is so important to understand because we are talking about these systems that are in in so many ways defining how we how we can do agriculture, how we think about agriculture, how society is thinking about agriculture, and how much um, yeah how, how important it is to stop well how important it is to to not only think about data and you know scientific comparisons of land use models and and, and all these things but you know if we really want to change you know the 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 structure of subsidy payout you know going back to the to your question if we want to change the political framework the european agriculture policy if we want to change many of these systems it can only if you ask me come through you know the society all of us to understand the value of agriculture to understand that agriculture is more than just production of food it is always a, it is always rural development, biodiversity, health, equality, you know, all these factors um, are, are, are agriculture. Um, and if society doesn't understand that what, what, what land use means, what food means in terms of the, the health benefits, but also in, in terms of what the, the way of, of how food is produced means for the regional context, for the people and the animals, and then, then it's getting difficult. And I think this is why we started doing so much more than well starting to to go much more into you know trying to touch people that are not yet in the agricultural bubbles and like like we are because most of them actually fall in love with it again you know we've just lost that connection but we still have time to build those bridges again and and, and have people reconnect to nature and and, and understand it um this was the reason why I wrote the book, or we wrote the book as a team. Uh, this was the reason why we agreed to to be part of the Disney Plus uh, documentary because we thought, okay, we need to touch people's emotions, we need to touch people's hearts. That that is the way forward in order to change the large system surrounding agriculture. Um, because at, in the end, at the end of the day, this is what we need to do. Um, we, um, yeah, agriculture and farming and farmers have to be at the at the epicenter of, of um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, coolness. You know, the, the farmers are, are the custodians of our world and future generations, and that needs to be understood. And and, and the systems have to be changed accordingly. Anyway, sorry for the long. Um, I went no, all over the place. But, um, I hope you know you're what absolutely, I'm absolutely fine. And I think, well, it's a systemic description that you describe. So you're trying to tr address the facets of that complex system. And and you're so right because if we cheapen agriculture, if we cheapen food, we're actually cheapening life. And so it's really important that we not only take care of the total environmental cost and, and the true cost, and that we're adding value in that and and the re, the whole regenerative practices to is to create the conditions that are co conducive for life to thrive and flourish amid ever changing life conditions and specifically in agriculture it's to set up those those systems for success to thrive and flourish to really continue that regenerative process that symbiosis and and good soil health and then when the years come where there are droughts or there are floods or those things that the farm will be more resilient and have that uh german word widerstandsfähigkeit to actually weather those times and and processes properly so i i, I really i really like that um you i know you've invited me and and, and many others to the farms quite a bit do you um kind of have a, a steady process of people to come by and, and and watch and look and see what you're doing? Or do you also offer work away programs where you can have people who say, I'd like to go and help and be on the farm and be part of this team to help him uh, be successful? Do you have things like that? And what are you seeing in the trend as far as since the this, this series and the book came out that more people are saying, wow, you, yeah, Benedict's inspired me. I want to go start my own farm, but I think I better go visit him first to get a little bit of uh, 
uh, what I have to look forward to. Well, I mean, as far as I think, you know, um, I think our team on, and my team is more inspiring than I. It's uh, because they are the ones that are really doing everything um, all day, specifically outside. I, I just, I just help working when there's press or someone filming. Other, otherwise, <laughs> um, I know. But um, uh, so you know, I started back in the day um, with 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 an agriculture company that was more or less struggling to be able to to you know keep out of the the red numbers um as i said we had one drought after another and I, we was we were fighting for survival uh, during those days those years um at the same time the forestry which usually is always one of the two is better and the other one is worse so they can kind of offset each other but the forestry also had the biggest storm that it had ever seen and and, and the yearly um well timber takeout you would you would plan was put on the floor uh, put put on the ground through that storm so for three four five years we had to clean basically the forest so the forestry was basically red red numbers and the agriculture was also more or less red numbers so this was the time where i realized okay i have to change everything in a sense right um and um so it was just insane insane work and insane stress i didn't sleep at all uh, luckily i didn't have a family back then <laughs> you, you tend to have a bit more time i guess but um you know these were the days where we started building everything you know i um i try to write any kind of innovation grant from from whatever you can think of and everyone always said nah this is no innovation you know if there's no technological aspect to it if there's not a drone if there's not blockchain then this is obviously not innovation and i said but guys this is this is systemic this is ecological this is social innovation um but i knew that the time wasn't right then so i used everything that i still had um which was a few really bad shares from my investment banking time and and a car from my venture capital time and then i sold both of them i always say i i, I swapped 200 horsepowers uh, for the 20 cow powers because i bought my first 21 cows from from the car um and the shares that i sold um i invested in the first agroforestry system so this is how everything started so i, I built a company then in 2019 beginning of 2019 um to basically get going because i always thought okay um if if i can just start going and showing people what we're doing hopefully i will convince them that you know this is why we do it and why maybe this is also not too stupid to do um so in those early days in those early years i always knew i i i cannot i cannot do this myself like i not not do i have a team that can do it i don't have the knowledge i can't do it i don't have any money or capital quite the opposite um, so I knew, you know, I, I need, I need people. And um, so from, from the very beginning, the DNA of our farm ha has had always been, um, to invite people here and to, um, hopefully touch them and make them understand why we are doing what we're doing and why it's important to find supporters, um, really financially also. Um, and, and we were just very, very lucky that, that, you know, I've, I came across follow food, um, which is a company here in Germany that does like, uh, ecological products in, in the supermarkets, which is like a tracking code. And, and they started supporting us. Um, I, I found, I always was lucky to find some form of capital flowing into the company to be able to you know, do the next agroforestry system and do the next project and the next agroforestry system. And suddenly we had a team and, you know, everything started to grow from in, in, in all the directions. And then in 2021, we were able to build a foundation because I said, look, I want to, you know, I want to have this scientific, scientifically monitored. We want to do research here. We want to have education. We want to do nature conservancy projects. So luckily I found um a family that i i i, I owe a, a great debt to which is the the um schmidt heine family from from zurich uh, and the avina foundation uh who were then quasi the, our first mother foundation that enabled us to build the foundation and basically professionalize everything that we were already doing 
and and all of that always just came with you know inviting people to come um being out there talking and 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 just you know investing into getting to know people inviting people taking out time to welcome them and and so this has always been as i said part of our dna and it has and without that it would have never we would never do what we are doing right now we would never be as fortunate as we are at, at this point um and now we have sort of more we're trying to be more professional about it so you know we have different programs that we run where for instance we have around 30 interns every year so we always have about 10 interns that come in three month periods so that is a large part of what is really important for us not only from an education point of view but also they they are a great help most of the time um, then we have a certain flow of people coming for official farm tours um, then we have quite a lot of events that are going on and companies that are booking it um, for us it's always just important that if people come here they need to have also the the connection to what we're doing so you know you, you can't come on the farm to do your wedding or whatever i mean if you can if you do the the wedding on a farm tour i would say yes maybe but probably that's not no but um, so for us it's important to share sort of the work that we're doing and the values and 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 everything that we kind of stand up for um and um and that being said you know i still have um a lot of people coming and um um a lot of politicians a lot of scientists a lot of people that we you know we kind of still want to keep on doing what we're doing because in the end of the day you know you can tell everyone you know this is important and that is important and don't do this and do this and whatever but my experience is if people actually experience something emotionally and they touch it they feel it they smell it you know that changes you that that sticks with you um and so we yeah we want to we want to we want to grow that part also of, of what we're doing um because you know we've had one or two formats where we had you know really influential ceos coming uh, that can really change something and for them to you know go through a regenerative farm and then you know be confronted with their own maybe value system but also wrong information about how things are going um is a very interesting concept because you know if they they're standing in, in the middle of 250 cars and we're moving them from one spot to another and we tell them why the cows are probably the best thing on the planet to store carbon in the soil and to grow soil health and why they're so important for the water cycle and biodiversity you know they're like what's going on like the ceos often ceos haven't heard anything critical of, about themselves for over 30 years or they always think that they know everything already which is a different topic for itself but to get someone out of their comfort zone into a place where they're uncomfortable because they don't know it and then to realize that they are only human um is really a very interesting effect it can have potentially on people so yeah um so to, to answer the question, yeah, we have a lot of people coming. Uh, we we'll really enjoy doing it. Uh, and I think there's, that it, it lies a great potential in doing so also. You, you mentioned earlier about uh, keeping things regionally and working with people and uh, following, you know, um, the, the food chain in some respects. There was a study that just, just released um, not even a month ago that uh, as a global study, um, but there was a specific part in there in Germany that a lot of the Germany's agriculture exports are almost one to one with their imports. So uh, let's take potatoes, for example, the same amount of potatoes that Germany's exporting around the world is that almost the exact same being imported in potatoes. Um, and it seems just like a movement, unnecessary movement. Uh, of food and and products and so how do, how are you doing that on the farm keeping things uh, uh, regionally locally things like that what is your view is on, on that and then are you doing community supported agriculture CSA models are you doing any other things that are interesting that you can tell us about um, so there's a, let's say there's a multitude of of things um, so starting 
um, with the CSA model, we are very lucky to partner with um, two beautiful souls, um, Anin Deacon, who are called Acapulco. They are running um, a, a, a vegan market garden on our ground, um, supplying through a CSA model in, in, in the area, but also in Berlin. And I'm very lucky to have them, but also uh, my whole family gets to enjoy uh, their vegetable boxes. And um, uh, and so that's a beautiful addition to the team because, you know, innovation doesn't mean you have to do everything yourself. Innovation can also mean you find people that use some of what you have uh, to, to create their own life, which is really um, something very beautiful if it goes right, obviously. So that is one part. Um, as far as uh, sort of our distribution is concerned, obviously the cows and, and the meat of the cows and the leather and everything, all the products that we are trying to use, um, we sell through our online shop. Um, I actually shoot the cows myself on the farm. So we have the whole circle closed on the farm. The calves, you know, I'm the, I'm the first person they see. Well, Luciano and I, so the guy who's, who's responsible uh, my colleague for for the cows and I we are the first ones that the calves see when the, when other than the well other than the herd obviously when, when they when they first see the day of light um, and then we're with them all their life and then I shoot them on the pasture in the same group they never see a trolley they never see anything like they never get feed stuff they only you know they 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 are on, on agricultural cropland all year uh, in the summer and in the winter. Um, and, um, we also have our own butchery on the farm. So the whole process is closed and, um, and that has an influence on, on also kind of the nutrient cycling of the farm, right? Because before, you know, we were an industrial ecological farm, so we had no animals. So we had to import nutrients from hundreds of miles away. And if you think about just a rough estimation, let's say 2000 tons of manure, if you think of that one trolley can carry or is allowed to carry 25 tons. Just think of the number of trolleys that we need to get all the nutrients here. Let's say 300 kilometers each. Calculate that in CO2 emissions and the whole inefficiency of that is just mind blowing. And then you have it lying on, on, on one particular spot. The quality is so bad because you've got some aerobic, some anaerobic, you've got something going in this. It's just terrible. And then you spraying it on the field just makes no sense. So that was one of the first steps and also one of the first motivations to say, well, if we have our own cows, we can close our own nutrient cycle. And we're already kind of, you know, we're not only uh, product diversifying, we're also risk diversifying. And closing the own nutrient cycle is, was always, you know, wanting to also uh, increase my independence. Uh, so that is one thing I think which is already kind of going well, although we still need some more cows to cover a thousand hectares. We're now at 250 heads and I think we should be going to 400, 450 heads. Um, unfortunately, as far as the grain operation is concerned, other than maybe some specialities that we do with bakeries and things like that, most of our agriculture produce, so be it wheat, barley, spelt, you know, uh, rye and, and sunflowers and, and some other things that we, that we grow, that all is being, well, it leaves in, in anonymity, right? So it's, it's commoditized like, like every other let's say agriculture produce in that, in that measure, I guess. Um, so there, you know, we are, we're, we're not doing much better than anyone else. And, and I think that's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously it's a systems problem um, and one that we need to solve, I think. Um, but we, um, we talked about this offline a little bit um, before in Malta, a little bit about the commodities and things. So what, I mean, what's your personal uh, feeling or when you, when you reach in your gut, I mean, do you eventually hope to be in a position to get out of that? Uh, it's kind of a bad system. You almost feel trapped. You're like, Oh, this is not really good. I'm, I'm held hostage a little bit by this system. Are you, are you looking at ways or are you uh, planning or have any, any things that maybe you can share with us that you're planning to eventually move in that direction to get out of that? Um, well, you know, just like from a sort of philosoph philosophical uh, point of view, I'm, I haven't yet, I haven't yet found my, my solution in a sense. Well, cause what I observe is, you know, going back to what we said earlier, you know, we have been just very, very good at producing masses for cheapest possible price. Yes, we know today that we need to 
look at it different and we have more you know uh, worries that we have to include into that system you know climate adaptation biodiversity etc etc um but that system also has brought us to the point where we are today so not everything is bad about that system you know we had you know we had to rebuild after wars or there was famine so so there was enough reason to 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 develop it and and in that sense you know i i also don't think that the whole world necessarily needs to be ecological or regenerative or this or that i think we just have to be a a lot better at um at finding the right agricultural tools and instruments in specific regional ecological contexts to have good outcomes that are defined also by the regional characteristic of 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 what is needed there you know um because i know people that are doing very good conventional agriculture they are building soil health they are not de depleting biodiversity but they are and and they have insane soils and great water and they're using you know herbicides or whatever instrument they they are using once in two years once in three years and that, that 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 is a good model you know um because i think the ecosystem can withstand um applying some some chemicals at some point in the given as i said regional context um but um um what was the question again sorry i lost you there for a sec so uh, ma mainly on the on the commodities are you trying ah, to get yeah. eventually diversify or get out of that that exactly. model so that you don't have to play in that so that's going to truly be either uh, self-sustaining or, or very regional so that it's not a commodity. Most commodities are usually yeah. don't remain remain regional anyway. And so it plays into the regional question as well. Um, yeah. So what, what I want, what I want to say is that, you know, there, I think, I think we cannot, I think we're doing a mistake if we think the solution is all just regionally to be making sure that you know the the, the value chain and, and and all of it is is solved in a regional model like i don't think that is applicable to our world and globalization and also not applicable to the challenges that will be faced in certain countries so we have to have we, we're going to be having to find a way of keeping worldwide trade alive at the same time being better at you know closing nutrient mineral water whatever cycles just as you described you know importing potatoes and exporting potatoes i mean there's so many so stupid examples of what is going on you know being shipped through a to b because of four cents a pound or whatever um but i think that is just yeah in my belief it's 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 very important to understand that you know we will have to be able to supply countries and regions with food um effectively because they will suffer from huge food losses and droughts and if we are not able to do that as a world community we're going to have wars of course all over the place right so finding that balance of of getting rid of the absurdity of that system yet making sure the system still stays alive in a sense of being able to support the people that the communities that need it in that moment that i think is is the challenge and yet that is what technology is actually very good at complexity um but right now we're using technology too much if you ask me to um making the exploitative system even more exploitative that if designed exactly in the past. i agree with you as well i mean we we could uh discuss this uh for ages there there is currently around uh 68 percent at the very lowest we've seen but upwards of of 80 percent of germany's uh uh salads fruits and vegetables come from two places from spain and the european organic standard from spain or from uh, the netherlands um, at least 40 percent come from the netherlands uh, as well during a world that is suffering droughts and floods and climate change and a lot of issues, uh, I can't foresee in the future, regardless of trade and regardless of commodities and how, how we've traded our food in the future, that um, if all of a sudden uh, 
the Netherlands starts to flood and, and their great solutions of, of greenhouses and the way they grow crops or Alameria in Spain, where they produce a lot of the organic standard fruits and vegetables and salads and things for for Europe, that they're going to say, oh, no, we're suffering here. Let's make sure we get Germany their food. Um, and, and we saw during the Brexit, there was a huge issue during the Brexit and the pandemic where the supply chain with that global trade broke down and a lot of products weren't, be de weren't being delivered around the world. And that's the type of resilience and things that I'm talking about, because in those instances, because of that global trade being disrupted, a lot of organizations uh, invoked the Act of God clause. They were in contracts to deliver food and products and services from, from Asia or overseas or, or the Netherlands or other places. But because of the confines of not only the Brexit, but the pandemic, they said, wow, we just can't do this. We have to invoke this act of God clause that, that we can't deliver those products. And then at that point, that's when you see the grocery stores reduce on, on, on what their service uh, and delivering. And, and, and th that's one of the biggest reasons I like regenerative ag and the practices of, of uh, biodynamic organics and certain things is because we have a set of re a little bit of set of resilience in there, Widerstandsfähigkeit, that gives us the opportunity to to weather those hard times and and kind of pull back and and deliver the services regionally. And so th that was kind of my thought as how how you as a farm, knowing that it's full of a uh, uh, sand and now you've regenerated, it, you're in that process that if you're even going to look further out, that maybe you, in, in case another pandemic, another thing happens, that if you will, will be better placed for the future. That's the, that's the main uh, reason I ask those questions. Yeah, I mean, um, well, first of all, you know, I think um, there's only so much you can do. Um, and um, at some point, you know, I've, My my focus is so strongly of sort of having our foundation as a living lab for regenerative agriculture and forestry and being able to look at our farm and the forestry in transition to become truly regenerative in one of the driest and, and most difficult areas in, in, in Germany. Um, to learn from that, from to be able to share that, to be able to influence um, as much as I possibly can. You know, this is my life's goal. Is I want to, you know, leave a mark. I want to help. I want to have impact through through the work that we do. And and that in itself already <laughs> is quite complex and a lot of work and you know um, a lot of highs and and, and uh, a lot of lows. And um, so um, so that that is my focus. Um, I think there is a lot of you know, initiatives that are working on other things. And I think, you know, when it comes to problems, you just have to split them up and, and everyone takes part of it because then we can do it together. Um, so it, it just hasn't been a focus. It could be, you're absolutely right. And it probably from a economic sense, probably would make most sense for the commercial side of the farm. Um, but it, it's just, I'm just too intrigued to work on, 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 you know, innovative, regenerative methods, understanding them better, finding corporations, sharing the knowledge, sharing the inspiring people with, with what is possible and, 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 and trying to, you know, shift the paradigm. Um, yeah. I, I totally understand. There's a global, uh, shift, uh, in the regenerative movement in the acceptance of that, uh, in the U S in India, we saw Vandana Shiva, in Malta when we were speaking and uh, she, you know, she's doing a lot around regenerative uh, Alan in Australia and in the U S and, and uh, there's a big uptake. There is a farm bill and a lot of things passed in the U S as well, a big push around regenerative ag. So it's also at that transitional point where we were back in 2006 from uh, regular agriculture to organic agriculture, the shift of more 
organic type of agriculture and more regional agriculture in Europe and, and then actually the world. And now we're at that same cusp. There's a, a, a lot of movement into this, this regenerative uh, practice, which is basically a subset of permaculture. It's just another mixture in the permaculture toolbox uh, perennials, agroforestry, agroecology, regenerative ag, silviculture, holistic land management, and, you know, go on and on. We could talk about so many different uh, types that are just subsets that are emerging. And we're also seeing the regulation and law shift. And when I said, I thank you so much, not only for the German speakers, but for in general, you have done more for the regenerative movement, showing the example, giving people inspiration and hope that you you don't need to. Nobody's born as a regenerative farmer. Nobody's um, uh, goes to this some glorified school or has to have a Ph.D. Uh, it's a, a much different process. It's a much more human process, uh, but it just works because. You don't need to put all these technical inputs into it. You don't need to put all this complexity into it. It's just the way life has worked for a long time. And so uh, I've also heard the pushback that you mentioned with um, uh, when you try to say this is a very innovative way of doing agriculture. They're saying that's not innovative. That's no technical things involved in that process. Well, symbiosis is an ecological phenomenon and the world's fastest form of human and evolutionary innovation we've ever seen. It's super exponential. It's quantum tunneling. Uh, you can take any technical or mechanical or reductionist system in our world, um, and I'll put it head to head with our regenerative symbiotic uh, innovation, and we will hands down win. The whole thing we're trying to do with quantum computers and quantum mechanics is to replicate what in the hell is photosynthesis doing on in plants and in fungus and in, in the mycelium uh, mycorrhiza web that is quantum mechanically. That's exactly what quantum computers are trying to replicate. How in the hell does nature act quantum mechanically every single day? And so when somebody says, oh, that's not very technical, I says, well, you probably need to go back to school or you don't know what very technical is because it's the most complex living system on earth. It's living soil, it's photosynthesis, it's you know capturing car carbon and creating oxygen. Uh, I don't see many computers or you trying to do that with a, a new delivery app, you know, or a new dating app. I mean, that's not very innovative. So. Uh, I, I, I've been doing this a long time, as you know, and so I, I love those type of discussions because I push right back because it's mainly people who who haven't ever farmed or don't know the, the wonders of nature and the things that you, you talk about. And that's why I really love how you not only you say, you know, I'm I'm. I'm doing these. I, I, I'm I'm there, but there's a team behind it. There's tons of of heroes that have come before us that have written the books, they've done the work, they've done the practices and say, hey, it's not just my one method, let's combine them all and make for every region of the world, for every place in the world, make the ones that work the best and, and move them forward. And so that's why I'm so glad you're here, carrying the banner, the flag and getting people excited. I mean, there's no better way Disney Plus series, that's a Farm Rebellion. Wow, I just blown away. I can watch it in English and in German. And uh, I've heard so many uh, conversations about people just say, he's such an inspiration. I just buff because, wow. And I really thank you for that. You're, you're also the book and you're, you're speaking around the world. We met in Malta. You've spoken all over. You're going to be in Groundswell. AgFest, uh, June 26th and 27th, I think it is, in England at this uh, beautiful Langcock Manor farm. It's in Her uh, Hertz Hertzfordshire, I can barely say it, um, where that's like the regenerative farming uh, event of the year. I mean, everybody's spoken there and you're going to be speaking there. So kudos for that. 
don't you feel this responsibility or this excitement that people are also happy that you're doing this work? I mean, what, what are your feelings? I've, I feel really uncomfortable and <laughs> listening to you and, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's really not all, I mean, it's, it's, it's the team that, that stands, you know, next to me that, that does the work. And as you said, you know, it's the, it's the, it's all the, the, the wisdom and, and, and the people that came before us that paved the way. And, you know, it goes back to, to, um, indigenous wisdom and indigenous knowledge and, and, and things that, you know, we are, we have just forgotten, I think. And, and there's so much beauty in, in all of this because the challenges couldn't be bigger, right? I mean, we know this and it doesn't matter who you are and where you are and what you think we are all gonna hold our hands going through towards the cliff, you know, and we can fight all along and say, this is right and this is wrong and whatever. But in the end of the day, it all really doesn't matter. Either we get it all together or we all don't. So. Um, so I love, you know, I, I just love being able to do what we're doing and, you know, I, I still risk everything <laughs> every day and I'm willing to do that. Um, and, um, <clears throat> you know, I don't know, you know, life, life's short and, and, um, it's up to us to change something if we don't like it. Um, and if we can, then it's our responsibility, I think. And, um, I see it as my responsibility and, um, I try to have as much fun while doing it. Um, and I think that's at the end of the day, what speaks to people also, right? Cause, um, you know, whenever we have guests here, everyone says, well, Benny, what do you do with the people? Like, they all have like, they have like, their eyes are shining and they're like, they're so happy to, and I say, well, yeah, we, we, we're trying to have a good time, you know? Um, and, um, and I think that's. I think that's what we can, that, that's, it, it, I, this is, if, if I could wish for one thing to happen, then it would probably be for us as, as business minded individuals, as entrepreneurs to not see sustainability as like an, you know, an ecological t-shirt that is like itching in the back, but, but to understand that thinking about the challenges, thinking about what we need to do in order to be more sustainable, or may, maybe even regenerative, you know, that is entrepreneurial mindset that is being profitable in the future because we are more socially, um, value, um, admitting because we are more, you know, e ecologically sound because we do the right things is the reason why we are profitable and why we're having fun while doing it. And, and I think that is something that we still kind of have to get to, uh, because today so, so much is all about, you know, um, you either like a, a, the climate hero, but that means, you know, you're not allowed to fly or whatever. Um, or you, you're an asshole you're, because you do all the things wrong anyway, but like, the, that's not how we're going to involve people. That's not how we're going to inspire people to do the best thing that they can possibly do. You know, if you, if you, if you give everything to, to, to make the world a better place, if for lack of a better word, then, Hey, enjoy your holiday take a flight and fly somewhere and enjoy it. You have worked your ass off. You can do that. Like, that's okay. At least that's how I see it. So, um, I don't know. I'm, you know, um, well, I have three more, uh, big questions for you. Three more really big questions or what? not all three are big. There's only the, this one is the, the, probably the hardest one and the biggest one that I will ask you the other two a little bit easier. I ask all my guests this. I've asked over 3,600 people this on video, and so you're not going to get by without it. Um, I want to know your specific answer to this. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you, for Benedict? Well, to be honest with you, I think that I think that's just never going to happen. I think it's just by definition, uh, utopian, um, because if there's one thing that I've learned, you know, you can never make it right for everyone, you know, <laughs> it just doesn't work. 
I think everything happens um, as it, well, I think everything happens in waves for, for lack of a better description, but there is, there is never going to be any light if it's not for the darkness, you know, there's never going to be any relief if it isn't for the pain. There's no, there's no benefit and there's no success without discipline and hardship. So I think, you know, it's, it's just never going to happen. The question is how can we raise the bar from the bottom up, so to say, and maybe find, well, let's focus on, um, so, so that life is livable for everyone, right? I think right now we don't, we're not there yet and not by a far, not by a far, far amount. Um, so before trying to make it right for everything, I would try to make it right for the ones that are suffering the most. Um, do we have everything that we would need in order for, to get there? Yes. hundred percent. No question about it. Um, is it. Uh, an ocean to cross, yeah, for sure. It's a long way to get there. Um, but yeah, um, and, uh, to be honest with you, I can't answer the question without being in this in 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 the situation that the people are in that I'm actually referring to right now. Um, so that's my. I think I think in that process you have answered it. So you're you're saying a world that works for everyone for you is one that takes care of those people who are not in the situation that you're in. As long as they're not in that situation, then that has actually a world that works for everyone. And you're, and you're saying it's not utopian. That's, you know, um, everybody has to have that equal, but we're all different. And, and um, that's kind of what I hear. Thank you for that. And there's no wrong or right answer. So I, I'm yeah. just glad to hear, hear your opinion. Um, what th that we haven't talked about so far in the podcast is something that's really important for you to get the message out to everybody uh, that's watching, listening. What's your really, what's your big message for everyone to uh, to understand and have a takeaway um, for for what you do and what your hope is? Well, I mean, I guess it depends on on who is listening. Um, I mean, as far as as. Uh, if it's just, you know, us as society is concerned, then I think right now for me, it is just really important for, to find ways to reconnect people with nature. Um, not from like this sort of, I don't know, ecological, whatever sense, just as like, you know, reflecting our role within, within the world and, and specifically when it comes to food, you know, we, we, we do have an influence on what is happening in front of our doors, as far as agriculture and land use systems is concerned with the choices that we, that we take. And of course that is also, and already a very privileged view on things. Cause as we know in the supermarket, the cheapest product is the one with the, with the most expensive production costs. Um, but I think, you know, We've, we've lost so much the connection to nature that today we're just eating highly processed food and we're eating it while we're running. And, you know, I think buy, buy real food and cook it yourself. And at the same time, don't shy away to eat good quality meat. Um, it is important to not think that, you know, the cows are the problem. They are very much the opposite. Of course, we have to change the system, but if we have cows that are able to have an influence on an ecosystem as they are supposed to as an animal, which is the cow, then they are the solution to so many of the big problems of our time. So they need to be part of a progressive regenerative land use philosophy for, for, for the whole world. So <clears throat> yeah, buy real food and, um, um, and don't, um, don't let cows be the climate killer. Uh, they are the very opposite. Um, yeah, I, I know you've got some things that you're working on on the horizon. I don't want to uh, let them too soon out of the bag. I know we can expect 
many more developments on uh, your foundation, on on uh, Gut and Böse on your farm and the work you do, and that will evolve and you will adapt and 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 show us much more. You also have some personal goals and ambitions and things with the family that will be coming out. So I I I would love as those things get closer and you have more insights and success stories and things that you've learned and and I know you'll be a success. So there's no doubt in my mind that things will go well for you, Benedict. You're a wonderful man, your family's great and you you're a hard worker. Uh if I could harness all that energy, I've seen you fidgeting in this chair and you're I you're a powerhouse and I, I love you and thank you for that, that you've really uh inspiring the world and especially the German people. That's dear to my heart. My my whole mother's side and family was German and uh, you know, that's how I got it came into the farming uh as well in my life. And it's so important to see this uptake and this inspiration. Thank you for doing that. Um, if you were to have know everything that you know now throughout your whole life to this point today, as we're talking, what would you do differently with all that knowledge? Was there anything you would do differently with the, the knowledge you have to this point? Starting from which age? <laughs> All the wisdom till today. What would you do anything different? Um, no, probably not. I mean, there's tons of things that I would have liked to um, probably do different in the moment. There's uh, tons of things that I would have liked to be able to take back. And I mean, but I think it's just part of life. And you know, I wouldn't want to change anything of the situation that I am in with the people that I'm surrounded with and, and, and the work that I'm able to do. Um, so for that, I'm endlessly grateful and I wouldn't change a bit of all the stupid things that I might have done and people that I might have heard and, and, and you know, that that uh, I'm still for, sorry for. But no, I, I still, um, I'm, I'm very grateful to be where I am and with who I am. And, and so... I wouldn't change anything, I think. That's great. Yeah, the, a lot when people ask me that, I just wish I would have started sooner. If I had that knowledge I have now, I wish I would have started that process sooner because I, I feel it's behind. But I also, it's the journey that you enjoy. This is just advice. Uh, and the reason I ask the question is, is it's advice to the, the our next generations, you know, on, on how to guide and help them uh, moving forward uh, uh, on the process, what to avoid mistakes or, or anything moving forward. And, and that's part of that life. You answered that in, in the question as well. So, Yeah, I mean, if you ask me specifically as far as that is concerned, then I think I'm pretty sure that my answer would also be never waste a second. Um, if you want to do something, go for it and don't ask anyone. Just go for it with everything you have. Don't wait around. Life is not waiting for you. No one is waiting for you. Um, if you have an idea, go for it. Ignore everyone and <laughs> and work hard and disciplined, and you'll get wherever you want to go. I think that's that's something also I had to learn in a sense, right? I mean, I have I have done much more in the last years than I have had in a few years before that, for sure. But if I wouldn't have had done that, maybe I wouldn't do what I'm doing now. So, you know, it's um, yeah. Exactly. That's, that's a discussion for later in the day with <laughs> Benedict Basil. Thank you for letting us all inside of your ideas. Wonderful book. Go out and get it. Watch the Apple or Disney Plus uh, series. Uh, not Apple, the Disney Plus series, uh, Farm Rebellion. And thank you for letting us all inside of your ideas. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. You bet.